Nancy and Kareem said as well. So let's go. I'm going to start with a kind of, um, well, I just want to say thank you to David again and um, pay tribute to him again for conceiving of and completely organising the conference. And thank you to you all, and especially thanks to Bas van Frasen, who's um, form so much of my thinking about philosophy of science, especially empiricism. Okay, good. So I'll start with a kind of paradox. The paradox goes like this. Empiricism is associated with the epistemic privileging of sensory experience. Modern science is based on experiment and observation, but it is highly revisionary of the manifest image and does not epistemically privilege the human senses. Yet many scientists characterize themselves as empiricists. And empiricists in philosophy claim science as the ultimate form of rational inquiry. So it looks like there's a paradox there. So my talk is going to be an attempt to resolve this paradox. Um, so just in the background, there's the idea that um, the epistemic privileging of sensory experience seems to require some kind of limitation of knowledge to what's observable to the human senses. And as such, that seems intention, if not incompatible with scientific realism. So I'm going to comment on that. I won't have anything to say about epistemic structural realism, but notice there's a strong connection between empiricism, concept empiricism and epistemic structural realism. Grover and Maxwell wanted to explain how theoretical terms can have meaning using Ramsey sentences by um, defining them in terms of um, observational terms, much like David Lewis. But there is a strong connection here with ontic structural realism because that I take that just to be more or less just fundamentally anyway, a commitment to realism about modal structure that realism commitment about realism realism about motor structure is rejected by van frassen as an empiricist but not by cartwright as an empiricist so she wouldn't call it i don't think realism about modal structure um but but what she believes in is a species of of modal structure according to me because nancy believes uh, i think still very much believes in powers and um sort of singular causal capacities and I, uh, insofar as Nora is making use of a robust notion of, of causation, then I, I think um, there's going to be commonality there too. Okay, good. So, um, so what's the relationship between the experimental tradition and empiricism, the senselessness of science, which by, I'll say what I mean by that, um, but basically it's the fact that science doesn't seem to give a special role to human senses, and modal structure. That's what I'll be trying to, to uh, explain. So let's just talk about what empiricism standardly is, you know, denial of innate ideas, denial of substantive a priori knowledge. All knowledge comes from experience. Well, just to sort of get the paradox on the table, right, that surely looks like the epistemic privileging of human sensory experience, doesn't it? Um, now, Lot, Barclay and Hume all added to this the claim that the mind only has direct knowledge of its own ideas. This is called idearism in a book, great book by Alan Musgrave called Common Sense, Science and Skepticism, or at least those words in some order. And um, all of Lot, Bartley and Hume, each of them says something more or less directly of the form, the mind only knows its own ideas. Now, that, of course, leads Hume to embrace the scepticism that Locke fudged and Barclay rejected. Barclay, you know, he thought, I won't be able to believe in tables unless they're just collections of ideas. So, I mean, he was an anti-sceptical philosopher and he saw the logical consequences of, of, of Locke's um, acceptance of, of, um, of idearism. But Van Frassen rejects this idea of idealism. He says sense data are as much theoretical kind of posits as anything else, right? So he's not a skeptic in general. Um, he maintains, however, the epistemic privilege of sensory experience. So let's talk a little bit about how Van Frassen conceives of empiricism. And what I'm gonna do really is suggest that um, we need to combine elements of, of, of what Van Frassen characterizes as materialism with, with empiricism to, to get empiricism properly formulated, which is kind of um, crazy according to Van Frassen's view of things, but not as I think we can make sense of it. So both the empirical and material stances according to Van Frassen are scientific approaches to philosophy, but where empiricists emphasize fallibilism, verifiability and falsifiability, and also to some extent skepticism and tolerance of novel hypotheses, materialists kind of go too far by regarding the theoretical picture of the world as matter in motion as a true and explanatory account. And then they go on to draw negative conclusions and that's what we talked about yesterday, she kind of rejects 
Um, they would just rule out in principle certain kinds of explanations to certain kinds of projects um, within science, like um, the project of investigating spiritual substance or something. So um, Van Frasen thinks that we have to formulate these positions as stances because the alternative is to think what people have standardly thought that there is a statement X plus that goes with any philosophical position X such that to adopt X is to believe X plus. But the problem is this gets us into trouble with empiricism because then X plus would be experience as the one and only source of information about the world. Uh, but for empiricists, any factual hypothesis must in principle be given over for empirical investigation. So X plus cannot be constitutive in empiricism after all. And see here the dichotomy between naturalized and transcendent empiricism. So the naturalized empiricist tries to kind of vindicate empiricism naturalistically and find out what counts as experience naturalistically. And uh, transcendent empiricist must impose some kind of extra empirical judgment of empiricism itself and of what counts as experience. And this is um, pushed by Jennifer Nagel in an um, insightful uh, paper called The Empiricist Conception of Experience, and I wrote about it in my work on Van Frasen's epistemology. So this is why Van Frasen thinks we have to have stances. What's the empirical stance? Well, according to him, it's generic admiration for empirical science and a specific norm of anti-dogmatism, which, of course, Nancy was endorsing yesterday, and I think many of us um, would say, you know, um, notwithstanding the um, problems with Karl Popper's falsificationism, he was absolutely right to stress um, fallibilism as, as important um, to scientific, to, to the nature of science. So um, empiricism can't consist, according to Van Frasen, of a doctrine such as that rational intuition cannot deliver substantive knowledge or that all knowledge comes from experience, because these doctrines amount precisely to attempts to rule out certain hypotheses. Empiricists believe that as in science, so in philosophy, so every philosophical hypothesis ought to also be accepted or rejected on the provisional basis and on the basis of evidence and arguments for and against it alone. So Van Frasen concludes that principle zero is false and that um, positions such as uh, empiricism and materialism are best understood as stances. Good, so. Um, stances are more than doctrines, they involve attitudes, commitments, forms of life, values. Stances don't admit of stance neutral adjudication or justification. Van Frasen is a radical voluntarist. Now, if that was all there was to it, to empiricism, it, if it was exhausted by open mindedness and fallibilism, it would have a toothless bite. The reason it's not is that these positive components in the empirical stance are accompanied by a negative one that's no less important to its identity. The story of empiricism is, according to Van Frasen, a recurrent rebellion against the metaphysicians. Aristotle versus Plato, nominalism versus Aristotelian scholasticism, British empiricism versus continental rationalism, and logical positivism versus idealism and romanticism. In current philosophy, Van Frasen led the charge against analytic metaphysics, a charge which I um, enthusiastically took up with Don Ross in Everything Must Go, but Van Frasen um, led it. While um, these empiricist philosophers share no set of doctrines. All of them criticize what they saw as extravagant metaphysical systems that were insufficiently in touch with science. So ironically, though Van Frasen is associated with skepticism about science, I mean, he really pushes empiricism as uh, deference to science and as um, a restraint on the tendency of, of philosophers to um, speculate metaphysically and go beyond science. So empiricism is characterized by a rejection of demands for explanation at certain points and strong dissatisfaction with explanations that proceed by postulation. In its current incarnation in the form of constructive empiricism, this disdain for explanation is expressed by skepticism about the modal content of scientific theories and an axiology of science, that is an account of what science's aims are, according to which its goal is empirical adequacy, not truth simpliciter. So empiric constructive empiricism is not an epistemology Van Frossen says very clearly, Van Frossen really has no epistemology. His epistemology is just don't be irrational, where irrational means violate the constraints of logic and the probability calculus with your um, beliefs at any given time. 
So it's a very, very um, weak notion of rationality that he has. Um, and, and there's no positive account of warrant or evidence or anything beyond that. Okay, but as we know, idealism lands us in the egocentric predicament, as Aya called it. Methodological solipsism is a road to nowhere, but collective epistemic is ende endeavor is a route to the stars, or at least we've taken as far as the moon and Mars and the outer solar system, although not, um, although vicariously, um, in the latter two cases so far. Now Van Frasen takes the manifest image for granted, but the methods of amputative inference that we use to gain knowledge of the observable but unobserved are the same as those we use to gain knowledge of the unobservable. And this is a complaint that realists have long leveled against Van Frasen. And um, it's no, one that I won't have much more to say about here, but I take it that everyone um, understands what, what's being claimed here. I mean, the thought is that we, we use inference the best explanation, we triangulate our evidence, we use all these checks and balances, but in principle, um, there's no difference between the ways we gain knowledge of the unobservable and the way we, ways we gain knowledge of the as yet unobserved. And there just aren't any good grounds, I would say, for the epistemic privileging of the observable. Um, and moreover, I will mention this later, David's already mentioned it, I've argued since um, 2000 in my PhD thesis, that um, before that, that the, the notion of observability is modal and that Van Frasen's modal um, atheism or modal, modal nihilism um, means that he, he, he just has no, no grounds on which to draw any kind of privilege, uh, any, any kind of um, objective obs observable unobservable distinction and therefore there's no, no way it could bear the weight. So even if you could give grounds for um, epistemically privileging the, the, the observable, actually, you can't even say what you mean by the observable. So what should we think about empiricism? Should we just junk the term? Well, I mean, Nora thinks not. I think Nancy thinks lot, not. Lots of us maybe think not, though Alexander um, perhaps will argue um, that we should. But you might think, well, look, empiricism is just so ambiguous and it just doesn't really mean anything anymore. Or it just means something really truistic, like scientists should do experiments. Right, well, I'm going to argue that is more or less what it means. But how do we get to that from the privileging of human sensory experience? In any case, the denial, I would say so, had a minute, but the denial of substantive a priori knowledge is not trivial. And as Nora was just saying, I mean, recurrently in the history of science, you do get scientists who try and um, justify their favorite theories with on, on super empirical grounds. And so I think it's important um, for us to be able to push back and say, hold on a minute, um, there's something unscientific about that. So how should empiricism be understood in the light of what we know now? So what I'm going to do is really say what we should do is naturalize empiricism. And to do this, we'll have to go in the direction of the materialist stance, as Van Frassen would have it, which goes much further than, than empiricism by deferring to science about what exists, by saying that science is complete, by saying that everything that exists is material, by um, having negative components as well, as I've already mentioned, no supernatural entities or whatever. Now, um, I don't suppose that any of you think any of these things are true, and I certainly don't. I mean, um, when we t say we should defer to science about what exists, it's a big problem of like, what do we mean by science? We mean current science or all future science that's I don't know, successfully documented everything that exists, which then we've got this kind of false, um, sorry, trivial versus false dilemma um, science probably tells us itself already that it's not complete because we have scientific knowledge of phenomena that we can't explain. Um, and science itself taught us that not everything is material. And so um, we need to be physicalists rather than materialists. Um, however, let's just suppose that you sort of put all that one side and say, well, look, suppose I was a materialist, then what if, if I tried to reformulate empiricism knowing what we know now? Um, how would it look? That's what I'm going to do. So materialists and, and realists, physicalists, um, they uh, embrace the idea that science is objective in three ways which Van Frasen kind of disdains. It takes us out the picture, it adopts value neutrality, 
It approached the study of, of its phenomena as if the existence and concerns of human beings were irrelevant. Now I'm gonna try and formulate empiricism in line with the objectivity of science, right? Paradoxically then, they take empiricism and make human beings irrelevant to it. Well, how do we do that when it's all about privileging human sensory modalities? Well, let's just note, if we're looking at, at science, it's a commonplace that as science has progressed, the role of first person sensory report, reports has diminished in favor of instruments. And you can see this in the difference in chemistry then and now where chemistry used to be, or, or geology used to talk a lot about the appearances of, of minerals. Um, and you can read articles about the progressive kind of downgrading and um, elimination of human um, sensory reports in, in, the, in the course of the progress of science. Science assigns epistemic weight to human sensory experience only insofar as it's an information channel. And as such, it has been augmented, refined, triangulated, and ultimately transcended. Right? So where Nora was talking about science, uh, sorry, about, about us being causally connected to the world, I'm gonna talk about an information channel. I think she, she means more or less the same thing. Um, or I mean the same, perhaps mean the same thing as what she said, but I have my reasons for talking about information rather than causation. Um, the reliability of inferences is orthogonal to whether they only involve unaided human perception. So, I mean, for example, um, you know, think even since the dawn of time, human beings have probably been like using um, the, the senses of other animals to augment their perception. So um, did I really um, see something there? Well, my dog's barking. I bet my dog can smell something I can't. Um, so I'm, you know, really using my um, using my dog as a kind of prosthetic um, nose. And um, of course I can use other people as prosthetic um, senses. So I could sort of say, well, I think I saw that there. Can you have a look and see if you can see it too? Um, and um, you know, more, more generally, uh, of course, um, with science, we're able to use all kinds of different detection techniques. And I would say that we just, won't rank the, the reliability of inferences by do they involve unaided human perception or not, and then somehow rank all the ones that don't as more secure. That, that would be crazy, right? If I've got human perception that triangulates with loads of other sources of information, that's going to be more reliable than human perception that doesn't triangulate with, with those other sources of information. And more generally, um, sources of information, none of which involve human perception that all triangulate, I would regard as more reliable than source of information that is human perception that doesn't. So does this mean science conflicts with empiricism? Back to my paradox in the beginning. Well, look, David's pointed out the skeptical tradition is only part of empiricism. There's the experimental tradition. This clearly doesn't conflict with the experimental tradition. This only partly resolves the paradox because it doesn't fully explain the role in the development of science of the other tradition in empiricism. And this skeptical tradition is actually important. Modern science needed the primary secondary quality distinction to get going. Right? So Galileo, Robert Boyle, uh, Descartes, John Locke, they all explicitly make the primary secondary quality distinction. They get it from the ancient Greek atomists. Um, it's impossible to imagine modern science without the distinction between appearance and reality and without the claim that some of the properties things seem to have in sensible experience they, uh, uh, those properties actually depend on us, right? And of course, now we, we, we know that um, there are color metamers. Um, we know that all sorts of ways in which uh, appearances uh, differ from, from reality. And um, furthermore, the skeptical tradition in empiricism I mean, skepticism has its, in Descartes, it's basically, the purpose of, of skepticism in Descartes is really to demolish the Aristotelian conception of the world. And it, it's, it does that by demolishing the manifest image. Um, so Descartes gives us an image of the world where it's just matter in motion with no primary qualities except um, figure, figure and motion and so on. Um, Locke adds mass as a further primary quality. You know, we might now think, well, we've got a list of primary qualities that include things like charge and spin and so on. Um, but we've certainly retained the idea that the, the manifest image is um, 
has been demolished as a picture of how the world is in itself. So if empiricism is the view that all knowledge comes from, the, from experience and that equals the senses, um, but, sorry, sorry, if empiricism is the view that all knowledge comes from experience, um, oh, I missed something gone wrong with my slides there, that's good. Uh, I know it's gone wrong, hang on. Right, good. Empiricism is the view that all knowledge comes from experience. Uh, experience equals the senses. Whoa, hold on, go back. Um, the extension of senses is traditionally understood as um, audition, olfaction, vision, touch, and taste. So is empiricism the view that all knowledge comes from audition, olfaction, vision, touch, and taste? No, that would be mad. Surely empiricists would, would recommend intelligent bat-like animals to seek knowledge through echolocation, right? And in any case, according to contemporary science, we've got about up to 10 senses. And empiricism is surely the view that knowledge comes from the senses, whatever they be, not the senses, this particular set of senses. So what we've really got is an instance of the intentional fallacy, right? Empiricism is not the view that all knowledge comes from the list of actual senses humans have, but rather knowledge, all knowledge comes from those faculties qua something, right? Qua what? Well, fairly obviously qua source of information about the world, qua information channel. This is how the senses are understood in science, so that perception can involve electric fields, magnetic fields, infrared radiation, and echolocation. So there are animals that use all of these um, modalities as forms of perception. If you look up uh, the senses in the context of science, then you'll get the senses are information channels, basically. The senses all involve transduction which is the transformation of signals from one form to another. So clearly it's the it's data that's important, that are important, not sense data as such. So sense data are important, qua data. Qua, what Nora was describing is just, you know, the world pushing back at us or what um, I, I think was the term that she, she used. I have, have very, very much the same idea in mind here. And of course, I mean, this is the idea, I'm claiming this is the idea that the empiricists always had, it's just that the only way to think of that idea was under the, the description, the human senses. But now we don't need to think of the idea under that description. Now we can think of the idea under the description, information channels. And that includes the human senses, but includes more. And it makes clear as well that um, we should think about the senses as, as reliable insofar as their information channels and with all that understanding that we can get about what kind of information we're getting when to what degree of fidelity from them. So insofar as we use the senses to arrive at knowledge of the world, we have to use triangulation anyway. Example from Van Fransen of the rainbow. Um, the rainbow triangulates well between us all. We all see rainbows at the same time in the same place but the rainbow isn't an object because it doesn't triangulate between the different sensory modalities. Now you can't bump into a rainbow, whereas the table in front of me, well, I can, I can hit it, I can, um, I can hear it, and I can see it, and there's triangulation among those different sensory modalities. And so, uh, Kareem was emphasizing how important triangulation is in scientific methodology. Um, I would argue it's important in everyday life too and um, insofar as we take the senses to be reliable that's partly because we are able to triangulate the information that we get from them and insofar as we use the senses to arrive at knowledge of the world we augment and refine them so glasses telescopes microscopes sound amplification so as Nora said data definitely definitely doesn't mean raw data and I mean, one thing to note here is that, for example, um, we might regard the data as um, the averaging of the results of several different instruments. And so what we record as the data point might not actually be the value that was given by any one particular instrument. And I would still regard that as data and say that that was the, what the information channel was, was giving us. So 
there's a, this is a fully um, theory laden idea of data here. And as Nora was saying, theory ladenness is not a bug, it's a feature, right? What that means is using all the best of our background knowledge to work out what any given source of information is telling us or in particular to establish what counts as a source of information and what doesn't. So the way we triangulate with our senses extends seamlessly to the use of instruments. And Galileo, of course, very natural form of argument. You know, people are skeptical about what they see when they look through the telescope. And Galileo says, well, if you know, look at that hill over there, you can see that tower really close up. Um, it looks just like it does when you go and walk over there and look at the cloud tower up close. Oh, why wouldn't you believe that it, it was magnifying in just the same way when you look at craters on the moon? So the senses are information channels to the world. Um, and empiricism naturalized should be understood as epistemically privileging data, not sense data. This way of formulating empiricism maintains its most important positive and negative components. Right, so we can still um, make sense of the repudiation of, of rational intuition as a source of knowledge of the world. Um, we can still make sense of the insistence that in good circumstances, the senses are sources of information about the world. And um, it's completely compatible with the experimental tradition in empiricism. Um, we have no tensions with scientific realism because um, we're not in any way epistemically privileging the observable here. But we are presupposing that the world has modal structure because information is modal, as um, I think of Tim Morden pointing this out in his book on quantum mechanics um, from the 90s, the first edition from the 90s. Uh, you know, his example, I, I always use the example as well, is the dog that didn't bark in the night time from the mystery of Silver Blaze by Sherlock Holmes. Uh, the, the, there's an information channel. Um, it, no, no signal is sent down the channel. Um, well, no, no, no matter or energy is sent down the channel, i.e. the dog doesn't bark. But because the potential is there for the dog to bark if it um, didn't know the person who came into the stable during the night, um, then Holmes receives information from the uh, complete absence of matter and energy traveling down the channel, um, which is to say that you know, it's because of the counterfactual fact that the dog would have barked had the person who stole the horse not been known to the dog, um, that Holmes is able to infer that the person who stole, stole the dog, uh, stole the horse is known to the dog. So uh, information is modal. Um, why talk about modal rather than just causal? Um, because I don't want to beg questions. So I think people say, I mean, I've been going on about structural realism is realism about modal structure for a long time. And people often say to me, I have no idea what you mean by modal structure. And I just say, well, this is an abstraction. You know what causal structure means. You know what law-like or nomological structure means, or at least people use those terms in philosophy. And I just mean by modal structure just you know, just an abstraction of that. Um, so some, the structure of natural necessity within the world, which according to Nancy is just causal structure of singular causal powers. Other people think that too, but I don't want to presuppose that. So Van Brassen thinks that the defense of scientific realism must involve modal metaphysics. In other words, the theory of laws of nature, singular causation, essence, essences or similar. Um, and um, I've argued that even the constructive empiricist must incur some metaphysical commitments. And so my empiricism naturalized here requires some kind of scientific realism and modal structure, but um, nothing I think stronger than, um, than Nancy would agree with. So I think, um, you know, in a way, what I've done here, hopefully, is just sort of stating the obvious. I think there's just a way of looking at empiricism that allows us to make sense of uh, what doesn't seem to make sense, which is the way it, it seems to emphasize the role of, of human sensation. 
Um, once we understand human sensation as an information channel and source of data, then we can capture everything that we um, meant when we said we were empiricists. And, and, and also we can see that the reason why science has become senseless is because um, there are all sorts of problems with the human, human senses as information channels and um, we can refine and augment them and ultimately transcend them to, um, to good effect in terms of, of generating reliable knowledge. Um, so, you know, of course, someone might say, well, we still in the end only get results by looking at, um, you know, by looking at the, the, the computer screen or whatever. But my point here is now that, but if um, the way that um, we get the information just doesn't depend on which human sensory modality we use, then we really have transcended human sensation. And you could get your results from the Large Hadron Collider in Braille if you wanted to, or you could have um, an audio voice could, um, in principle, could um, be telling you the, 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 the results. Now, of course, there may be aspects of our cognition that require us to use visual reasoning and diagrams and so on, um, but that's sort of um, a, separate, a separate issue, I think, from the, the main one of principle that I was addressing there. Now, I think um, earlier on in my talk, I was pressing the, um, the wrong button and, I, and skipping through whole slides instead of parts of slides, but that may be a good thing because I probably have kind of run out of time now and I don't know if I left anything out that was really important and um, in any case I think I'll stop so thank you very much. Thanks.